Welcome to CW Jaw Talk 38. The gods of Psalm 82. If you've been with me for a while, or if you've read any of my writings, or watch any of my public debates, then you know the gods of Psalm 82 frequently come up. But they're often not brought up and clearly identified, in spite of the fact that God, in Psalm 82, clearly identifies them as his sons. And, in spite of the fact that Jesus, God's Son, in John 10, 33-36, quotes Psalm 82 and the gods that God said exists, and uses it in his own defense against people who don't accept him as God's Son, and who accuse him of blasphemy for calling himself God's Son, making himself a god. Theos. Some Bible translations say God. But Jesus' use of Psalm 82 and the gods, plural, makes that practically impossible. It makes it nonsensical because why would Jesus quote a text about gods that are not God if he's being accused of being God? He wouldn't. He didn't. We're going to prove it today as we have in other days and in other ways you look at the videos linked below, you'll see my discussion in a video about the Melchizedek scroll, a Dead Sea scroll, written about a hundred or more years before Jesus was even born, that talked about the Jewish belief of the gods of Psalm 82 as spirits, not humans, like many Trinitarians and later Jewish interpreters believe those gods in Psalm 82 to be. So we have the Melchizedek scroll that explicitly identifies those gods as spirits. We have God in that psalm calling those gods his sons, sons of the Most High. We have Jesus in John 10, 33 through 36. We'll read it at the end of this show. Quoting that text in association with his claim to be God's son. So what is it? Are the gods of Psalm 82, I said you are gods, is the way God is depicted as describing them there, and how Jesus quotes it from there. Are those gods spirit sons of God, or are they humans, judges of Israel, like many Trinitarians and other interpreters say they are? Let's read some texts. First, we're going to read some texts that talk about the sons of God. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. The Psalm 82 gods are sons of God, sons of the Most High. Let's read several texts that talk about these sons of God, these sons of the Most High. And then we're going to read several sections in the book of Psalms before we go back and read Psalm 82 in the surrounding context again. Who are these gods, spirits, or human judges? Let's look at these sons of God from Genesis 6. It says, Now it came about when men started to grow in numbers on the surface of the ground, and daughters were born to them. So how could men grow on the surface of the ground and daughters be born to them? If men were not already taking the daughters of men so their numbers could grow upon the ground and daughters be born to them. I talked about this text in my text reading of Genesis 6 and there it was clear as it's going to be right here. These are the spirit sons of God who descended from heaven. Not these ones that I just read in verse 1 but the ones we're going to read in just a moment. But these men in verse 1 who aren't called sons of God. They're men whose numbers are growing on the earth and daughters are being born to them. Why? Because men are taking daughters and having relations with them so that they can reproduce and their numbers grow and daughters can be born to them. Then the sons of the, of the true God or God began to notice the daughters of men, that they were good looking, and they went taking wives for themselves, namely all whom they chose. Here, 
it specifies that sons of God began to notice daughters of men, that they were good looking and they took them as wives, after men started to grow in numbers and daughters were born to them that the sons of God began to notice. Many interpreters, a lot of Trinitarians in fact, believe that the sons of God are just sons of Seth, sons of men, not sons of God, in the spirit sense. And yet, there's absolutely no connection between the sons of God here and the sons of men who grew in numbers here and took daughters so that their numbers could grow and they could take their daughters. There's an absolute contrast, is there not, between the men who are growing in numbers through normal human reproduction, men are taking women, having relations, having children born to them, and then the sons of God noticed the daughters born to those men and women and began taking them as wives. This is consistent with histories we have in other cultures and in other texts outside the Bible, including histories involving beings like Poseidon and Atlantis, where we believe is now located on West Africa, Northwest Africa, at the Rikot structure. I've done a video about it. Many have done videos about it. It's very impressive information that's coming to light about the Rikot structure in light of what Plato has to say in the Timaeus and Critias that seems to identify that place as where Poseidon took one of the daughters of men and began to have children with them. Just like it says right here, it goes on to say right after the sons of God did this, and this is after Adam and Eve transgressed his law and were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, men started to grow in numbers. Daughters were born to them. The sons of God took notice, started taking them, and then Jahuah says, my spirit's not going to act indefinitely towards this kind of behavior. And he limits the age of humans, whereas before it was many hundreds of years. Now he limits it to around 120. And then in association with the sons of God taking the daughters of men, after the daughters were already being born to men who took men's daughters, the Nephilim proved to be in the earth of those days. And after that, when the sons of God continued until the flood to have relations with the daughters of men, and they bore sons to them, the mighty ones who were of old men of fame, famous people, heroes, like in many of the Greek histories and other histories, like I mentioned, Poseidon and others, Hercules would be more along the lines of the Nephilim type, whereas Poseidon would be one of the sons of God type, as an example. Either way, we have here a reference to sons of God that are spirit beings in contrast to the men and the women who were being born in numbers at this time. Now it gets a little more specific to where these sons of God are in our next text. Job 1.6 it came to be the day when the sons of the true God entered to take their station before Jehovah, and even Satan proceeded right in among them. Then Jehovah said to Satan, Where do you come from? At that, Satan answered Jehovah and said, From roving about in the earth and from walking about in it. Right, Contrasting where they are now in the presence of Jehovah, in their station before Jehovah, these sons of God, including Satan, had the ability to do what? Well, just like we read in Genesis 6, rove about in the earth and wander in it or take daughters being born to humans and procreate with them. Although we don't know exactly when this, this account here is after the flood. And so the issue of the Nephilim and procreation between the sons of God and humans isn't a subject that comes up. But nonetheless, it specifies that the sons of God are with Jehovah. They have a station, a place, a position. And even Satan could, at that time, go in among them. And this place and position is contrasted with the earth that Satan had come from, 
He's not in it right here with Jehovah. He had come from the earth, he tells him. Excuse me, Job 2.1. Afterward, it came to be the day when the sons of the true God entered to take their station before Jehovah. And Satan also proceeded right in among them to take his station before Jehovah. Verse 2, then Jehovah said to Satan, just where do you come from? At that, Satan answered Jehovah and said, from roving about in the earth and from walking about in it. Again, same as in Job 1, 6 and 7, they have a place before Jehovah in heaven, likely. Not in the earth, because that's where Satan came from. Then in Job 38, we get more descriptive information about where these sons of God have been or where they were. Jehovah tells Job, where did you happen to be when I founded the earth? Tell me if you know understanding. Verse 5, who set its measurements in case you know? Who stretched out upon it the measuring line? Into what have its socket pedestals been sunk down? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars joyfully cried out together, and all the sons of God began shouting, in applause. This is before humans were even made. This is during the time when things were made. Like in Genesis 1 when God says, let us make man in our image. After he was already making all of these things that are described as being made while the sons of God are there applauding at all the things being done. These are spirit sons of God. Psalm 89, 5 through 7. And the heavens will laud your marvelous act, O Jehovah. Yes, your faithfulness in the congregation of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to Jehovah? Who can resemble Jehovah among the sons of God? God is to be held in awe among the intimate group of holy ones. He is grand and fear-inspiring over all who are round about him or with him, like the word in John 1.1 1, 1 was with God. And as we know, angels speak and act for God. They did it in the burning bush with Moses. They did it with Manoah and his wife, Judges 13. So when it says, who can resemble Jehovah among the sons of God, what does that mean? Well, we know it's talking about spirits, right? Because who else would be in the skies but the sons of God who are spirits? The reason why it says no one can resemble Jehovah among all of them, even the ones who act like him or who, like Jesus, are the exact imprint of his being, Right? They're all spirits. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. He makes his angels spirits, Hebrews 1. And Jesus was a spirit as the word and became a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, when he was resurrected. So how, how is it they, they can't resemble him? Because they're not like him in that they are the one they follow and act like. Remember what Jesus says, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I don't do my own will. I didn't come of my own initiative. You see right there. If he didn't come of his own initiative, he's not like Jehovah in that way. He becomes like the Father by doing what the Father says. So they're not originally like him. They become like him by being like him by doing what he says and does. But they're not like him apart from that, or they would be the ones on their own doing what he does, and then they would be like him, right? If they were independently acting on their own like Jah, then they would be like him in the, in the way this says they're not. But when they follow what he says, and they, they don't do their own will, and they do his will, then they're like him, right? So they're all spirits and like him in that sense. And they become like him when they do what he says versus others who do not. But none of them, not even the firstborn son of God, is like the father 
in the ultimate sense that he's the one who does what you are supposed to follow. They're not out on their own doing everything on their own that others are following. That's why Jesus said, why do you call me good? Nobody's good except one, God. Now, of course, Jesus was good. We're good when we do what Jesus does. Jesus is good when he does what the Father tells him. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about good on your own originally. The only true God. The one who sets everything in motion. That others become like him if they're smart, right? If they realize that's the way I want to be. I want to follow the Father. Not do things on my own like the rebellious sons of God did in Genesis 6 or Job 1 and 2 with Satan. So I wanted to point that out so you understand that this is talking about kind of like the nobody is good sense. We become like God when we do what God does, but we don't do it on our own and then others do it after us. He does it and we do it after him. And no one resembles him in that way because nobody sets in motion the things that are to be done that are from God except the Father. All right, so I think it's pretty clear The sons of God are spirits. It doesn't mean we can't, in a figurative sense, be sons of God. You're going to see that that is the case in just a minute. And in Deuteronomy 32, 8, it also calls. It's a little bit different than the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text. It says the sons of Israel. But the earliest text says sons of God were given the nations as an inheritance that he appointed the number of the sons of God to the nations. And so that's why you have beings like the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, these different sons of God who are appointed and given authority over different nations. And Michael is given the nation of Israel. All right. So other than some texts where, you know, we're viewed as sons of God, right? Because we're all, if we're given life by like Adam, he's called the son of God in the New Testament. So there's a sense in which we can be sons of God because we're given life by God. But that's not the same sense in which the spirit sons of God are considered sons of God like in these texts, living in the skies, taking their station before Jehovah in heaven, coming down to the earth and taking daughters of humans and making Nephilim. There's a big difference. All right, now we're going to get into the book of Psalms more deeply before we read Psalm 82. Psalm 2.2 The kings of the earth take their stand and high officials have massed together as one against Jehovah and against his anointed one, saying, Let us tear their bands apart and cast their cords away from us. The very one sitting in the heavens will laugh, Jehovah himself will hold them in derision. At that time, he will speak to them in his anger, and in his hot displeasure, he will disturb them. I, even I, have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Let me refer to the decree of Jehovah. He has said to me, you are my son. Today, I, today, I have become your father. Ask of me that I may give nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your own possession. You will break them with an iron scepter and as though a potter's vessel, you will dash them to pieces. And now, O kings, exercise insight. Let yourselves be corrected, O judges of the earth. Now it's very interesting here. We get very early in the Psalms this antithesis, this enmity between Jehovah and his anointed one, his king, the one whom he installed and in a figurative sense, right, calls his son. But it's still temporal, even in a figurative sense, right? Because it's that day, today, I have become your father by being installed as king upon Mount Zion. So, very early on, you get this this enmity between the kings of the earth and Jehovah and his king. 
He talks about giving the nations as their the inheritance to his king and how he would break them to pieces. And then he refers to the kings that would be broken to pieces by his king and says, let yourselves be corrected, O judges. And here you get an actual term for judges. It's actually a verb, a participle um, with the article the plural form of crino, but it's actually more like the term judges, which many interpret the Psalm 82 gods as being, though it doesn't use judges there. It uses gods. All right, so I just wanted to read this text because it shows very early in the Psalms you get this antithesis between Jehovah and his king, the one whom he has installed, and the kings of the earth, the kings of the nations that are going to be corrected. Now, understand also who is installing this king that becomes Jehovah's son in the, in the initial sense, David, right? So we know there's a messianic application, but we're not talking about that today. It's Jehovah, right? So you have Jehovah as the God behind this king on Zion. And then you have these other kings that, as you're going to see, are put in place to rule those nations, but actually have gods behind them as well. Just like Deuteronomy 32.8 in the Dead Sea Scrolls teaches. So it's important to keep in mind that even though you have the human king, you have the god behind that king. And you have the same thing that's going to be shown with respect to these kings of the nations and the gods of those nations. Psalm 8, 3 through 8. When I see your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have prepared, what is mortal man that you keep him in mind? And the son of earthly man that you take care of him. You also proceeded to make him a little less than godlike ones. This is the New World Translation, which I use. I think it's better than most people believe, but it's not perfect. And I also criticize it where I think it's appropriate. But it's not nowhere near as bad as a lot of the Trinitarians claim it is. And I have a whole series going on right now. You can see the playlist on my front page of the YouTube channel that talks about how the NWT is actually superior, morally and translationally. And I have a lot more to say. But right here, there's really no need to use godlike ones. The Hebrew term is Elohim, gods. Sometimes it means God in a majestic or plural, um, uh, majestic plural sense. And there's many examples of majestic plurals, not just for Elohim, but other terms like Lord as well. I'll do a separate show on that. In the Greek translation, it's angelus, right? So a little less than gods or a little less than angels. And this is the text that's quoted in Hebrews 2, 7 and 9 to tell us that Jesus was made lower than gods, lower than angels when he was the last Adam. He was not a God-man. Sorry, Trinitarians. The Bible teaches he was just a man, a perfect man, the last Adam man. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And Psalm 8, 5, Hebrews 2, 7, and 9. Because if you're lower than the angels, if you're lower than the gods, you're not a God-man. That's why he said the Father is greater than I am. John 14, 28. Obviously, God's greater than a man, right? So he wasn't just limiting to that. He was speaking from the perspective of his entire person. God's greater than I am. Trinitarians like to play with those texts and bring in a dual nature concept that's not taught in the Bible and contradicted, in fact, by this very psalm as is quoted in Hebrews 2, 7 and 9. With glory and splendor you crowned him, you make him dominate over the works of your hands, everything you put under his feet, small cattle and oxen, all of them, all the beasts of the open field, birds of the heaven, fish of the sea, anything passing through the paths of the sea, like in Genesis 1 and 2. So here, though, we can see clearly the angels, right? And shown again by the quotation in Hebrews 2, 7 and 9, the author of Hebrews approved the translation of gods, Elohim, as angels, because angels are sons of God. Sons of God, Benai Elohim is the Hebrew, is an idiom that means 
members of the category to which you are said to belong. Sons of the singers are singers. Sons of the prophets are prophets. These are all uses of that same Banai idiom in the Hebrew text. Sons of God are gods. And they're called gods right here. You made them a little less than gods. Angels. So the very first time we get this use of Elohim other than for God himself is for angels, for spirits, not for human judges. Let's go to Psalm 9. The nations have sunk down into the pit that they have made. In the net they they hid, their own foot has been caught. Verse 16, Jehovah is known by the judgment that he has executed. By the activity of his own hands, the wicked one has been ensnared. Wicked people will turn back to Sheol. Even all the nations, I'm emphasizing that for a reason, forgetting God. For not always will the poor one be forgotten. This is very important because you may remember, and as we're going to see when we get to Psalm 82, the context in which God judges the gods is of the nations and how they're handling justice for the poor one, the widow, the boy. Very similar to right here, talking about how the nations forget God, right? And who's behind the kings of the nations? In the same way that God is behind the king of Israel, sons of God are behind the gods of the nations. Deuteronomy 32.8 and the examples of the princes of Greece and Persia in Daniel, and and other texts we'll get to in a moment. Not always will the poor one be forgotten, nor the hope of the meek ones perish. Right again, in the context of all the nations, not just Israel. This is important to remember. You'll see why, and I kind of just explained it, but it'll be more apparent when we read Psalm 82. Do arise, O Jehovah, let no mortal man prove superior in strength. Let the nations be judged before your face. It's all throughout the Psalms, right? We're just in Psalm 9. Let's move a little bit further forward, though, to Psalm 94. We can't read the entire book of Psalms, but I've selected various texts to show that in the context of Psalm 82, the whole book of Psalms as well, We'll get to the context of Psalm 82. We've read it before. I'm going to read it again. But we're kind of reading some surrounding material right now to show, number one, that in the Psalms, Elohim are angels, at least so far, Psalm 8. And there's this antithesis, always, everywhere, between the nations and Israel, between God's king and the nation's kings or rulers. And between God and the gods of the nations. You're going to see. Psalm 94, 2. Raise yourself up, O judge of the earth. Bring back a retribution upon the haughty ones. How long are the wicked, O Jehovah? How long are the wicked themselves going to exult? Because remember, the Trinitarians and others believe the gods of Psalm 82 are human judges of Israel. And, And there's really nothing to recommend that interpretation, as I'm showing here and I will show further in a moment. But even if they were correct, it wouldn't take away from the power of Jesus' argument in John 10, which we'll also read at the end of this video. They keep bubbling forth, Psalm 94, 4. They keep speaking unrestrained. All the practicers of what is hurtful keep bragging about themselves. Your people, O Jehovah, they keep crushing, and your inheritance they keep afflicting. So who's doing this? Right, It's his people and it's his inheritance, and and there's others who are crushing them, afflicting them, right? We know it's the wicked, but who exactly is this? The widow and the resident they kill, and the fatherless boys they murder. Very important to remember that. Just like here, it's important to remember that in the context of all the nations that are being described, the poor will not always be forgotten, and the meek ones. Similarly, in a contrast between the wicked who are persecuting God's people, his inheritance, he talks about those who are persecuting his people, killing the alien resident, and the fatherless boys. They keep saying, Jah does not see, 
And that is an instance of the yod Hey form of the divine name. And the God of Jacob does not understand. Verse 8, Understand you who are unreasoning among the people, and as for you stupid ones, when will you have insight? The one planting the ear, can he not hear? Or the one forming the eye, can he not look? The one correcting nations. Correcting nations. Who are doing all these things to the widow, to the fatherless boy, to God's people, to the poor, to the meek. The nations, can he not reprove? Even the one teaching men knowledge. For Jehovah is a great God and a great king over other gods. Now, the NWT uses other here to, to show a distinction between God and the gods that he's over. And just like in Colossians 1.15, as I explained in my Bible in the Trinity in Conflict, part 17, I don't think you need to use other at all, in brackets or not. But in a similar way, because Jesus is the firstborn there, and we know the mean of firstborn in non-figurative text, I went over all of them in that video, they use other to distinguish him from the things made through him. In the same way, they use other here in brackets, even though I don't think you need to, to distinguish between God and the gods, Elohim, Tusteus, the plural accusative form of hoi theoi, or ha theos being the singular. He's a great God and great king over all gods. Is he calling human judges gods here? Doesn't look like it. He's talking about reproving the nations because of the way they're treating his people and the alien resident and the father's boy and the widow. But then he talks about how he's a great God over all other gods, like the sons of God who came in to take their station before him, even Satan. Like the sons of God that Deuteronomy 32, 8 in the Dead Sea Scroll teaches were given the nations as an inheritance. Here we appear once again to have Elohim and the plural theos, hot theos, used for spirits. Like in Psalm 8. Let's take a look at Psalm 96. But it's important to recognize, right, just like God's the one behind his people, these are the gods that he's over in the context of reproving, correcting the nations that have had these sons of God appointed over them. Psalm 96, 1. Sing to Jehovah a new song. Sing to Jehovah all you people of the earth. Sing to Jehovah, bless his name. From day to day, tell the good news, of salvation by him. Declare among the nations his glory, among all the peoples his wonderful works. For Jehovah is great and very much to be praised. He is fear-inspiring above all gods. Elohim, Tusteus. In the context of declaring his glory among the nations. Excuse me. Next verse. For all the gods, Elohim, Hoytheoi, of the peoples are valueless gods. Now, in the Greek, it calls them demons. And in the Hebrew, it just says they're worthless. They're not, they're not of any worth, right? And they're really not, right? In comparison to Jehovah, right? I mean, they're providing a function in a sinful world. They're maintaining authority over people who are rebellious and not acting according to the image in which they were made, which is why we have these types of governments and these gods appointed in the first place. And in fact, they're responsible for the mistreatment of his people, crushing them, afflicting them, the widow, the alien resident, the fatherless boy, the poor, the meek. But he's still over them, right? The one correcting nations is the great king over all the gods. We it says to declare his among the nations his glory because he's great and very much to be praised over all gods. 
All the gods of the peoples are valueless gods or demons in the Greek. But as for Jehovah, he made the very heavens. Dignity and splendor are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. Ascribe to Jehovah, O you families of the earth. Ascribe to Jehovah glory and strength. Verse 8, ascribe to Jehovah glory belonging to his name. Carry a gift and come into his courtyards. Bow down to Jehovah in holy adornment. Be in severe pains because of him all the earth. Verse 10, say among the nations, Jehovah himself has become king. The nations that have their own gods or demons. The Israelites were to say, Jehovah has become king. Productive land has become firmly established so it cannot be made to totter. He will plead the cause of peoples in uprightness. He will plead the cause of peoples, of the peoples among the nations. This is very important to to keep in mind as we get closer to Psalm 82 and what God goes in among those gods to do because it's all throughout the book of Psalms. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be joyful. Let the sea thunder and that which fills it. Let the open field exult in all that is in it. At the same time, let all the trees of the forest break out joyfully before Jehovah, for he has come. He has come to judge the earth, not just Israel. He will judge the productive land with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness. Jehovah himself has become king. Let the earth be joyful. Let the many islands rejoice, the whole earth, not just Israel. He will judge the productive land and the peoples, every island, the many islands. Clouds and thick gloom are all around him. Righteousness and judgment are established. Play, are the established place of his throne. Righteousness and judgment. He goes in among the gods in Psalm 82, as we're going to see, to judge them. For all of these reasons being described all throughout the Psalms. Before him a very fire goes and it consumes his adversaries all around. His lightnings lighted up the productive land. The earth saw and came to be in severe pains. The mountains themselves proceed to melt just like wax on account of Jehovah. On account of the Lord of the whole earth. Just like we read in Daniel 4 and 5, right? The spirit sons of God may have been given the nations as an allotment. Deuteronomy 32, 8. But it's the heavens who rule. And if Jehovah, Jehovah decides that one of the spirit sons of God's rulers should no longer rule, you're going to be acting like a beast, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, until you understand. It's the most high who's Lord of the whole earth. He's the ones who lets his sons have authority in the earth in the first place, whether it's Satan or the other sons of God. The heavens have told forth his righteousness. All the peoples have seen his glory. Verse 7, let those serving any carved image be ashamed. Those who are making their boast in valueless gods. Now, I don't agree with NWT's use of gods here. The word gods, Elohim, is not actually in the text. It just says things which are insufficient and adequate. But it is in the context of images, and it does use God's next. Bow down to him, all you gods. Elohim. In the Greek, it's hoi angeloi, the angels. Just like in Psalm 8, the angels are gods. They're told to bow down before him, even though they're the gods behind the carved images of the nations. Why? Because they're allowed to do what they're doing, even have their own life, because of the Father. He's the one who allows it at all. And he decides that one of the rulers has to fall, Nebuchadnezzar or anyone else. They fall. The gods of the nations aren't so powerful that they can resist Jehovah. They can't. They're the reason he, they, he's the reason they exist. Now, some people believe that this text is quoted in Hebrews 1.6, where it says, 
let all the angels of God worship or bow before Jesus, the firstborn, when God brings his firstborn into the earth. Of course, proskuneos use the many beings in an honorable, respectful, even worshipful way. But I don't think that's the case here. First of all, the form of the verb used for worship is in the second person. Whereas in Deuteronomy 32, 43, there's an extended reading in the Septuagint that matches the verb of proskuneo perfectly. Proskune satos, sa, proskune satosan, I believe. It's the third person plural, which is exactly what you see in Hebrews 1, 6. Not in Psalm 97, 7, even though it does use angels here. And in Deuteronomy 32, 43, proskune satosan, I believe it is. It's word for word the same as Hebrews 1, 6, except instead of angels, it says sons of God. Bow down before him, all sons of God. But then in the very next part of Deuteronomy 32, 43, in the Septuagint, it refers to the angels of God. So it looks to me like the author of Hebrews 1, 6 is, is quoting from Deuteronomy 32, 43. And instead of using sons of God, is just using angels. In the same way that the Hebrew uses Elohim, and angels is used, which is why in Psalm Hebrews 2, 6, 7, and 9, you have angels, not they oi, because it often identifies those gods as angels in the Septuagint, like in Psalm 8, 5, or right here, right? Just because this may not be quoted in Hebrews 1, 6 because of the verb form used of proskuneo, it doesn't change the fact that the gods, Elohim, are angels here. They're the sons of God who have been appointed over the nations that use these carved images, idols that aren't real. They're just images. But behind those images, like we also read earlier, are the demons. Angels who have rebelled against God or been chosen by him to have authority over the nations like Satan in a sinful world with sinful people that have to be managed while God is developing his people back at this time to bring forth the Messiah. Once again, though, we see Elohim is used for angels, not human judges. We know that because human judges aren't behind carved images of the nations. Verse 8, Zion heard and began to rejoice, and the dependent towns of Judah began to be joyful by reason of your judicial decisions, O Jehovah. For you, O Jehovah, are the most high over all the earth. You are very high in your ascent over all gods. Elohim, to stay use in the Greek. So once again, in the context also of the gods behind the carved images of the nation's gods, we get Elohim used for gods, real gods of the nations that are also identified as angels or demons, like we read earlier from the Psalms. Oh, you lovers of Jehovah, hate what is bad. He's guarding the souls of his loyal ones. Out of the hand of the wicked ones, he delivers them. Light itself has flashed up for the righteous one and rejoicing even for the ones upright in heart. Rejoice in Jehovah, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy memorial. Sing to Jehovah a new song for wonderful are the things he has done. His right hand, even his holy arm, has gained salvation for him. Jehovah has made known his salvation in the eyes of the nations. He has revealed his righteousness. Very important. Right, because we're lead, we're, this is all leading to Psalm 82. And what God there chooses to do among the gods, in the council of God, he judges them for the very things we're reading about in association with those same gods of the nations. And so when he goes in among those gods for the very same reason, it's much easier to understand with all this context in mind, and we're going to read the full context of Psalm 82 in a moment, than that he's addressing Israelite judges as gods. They're never, Israelite judges are never anywhere else called gods. 
But the angels are, the demons are, the sons of God are called gods. Psalm 135.3, praise Jah, for Jehovah is good. Make melody to his name, for it is pleasant. For Jah has chosen even Jacob for himself, Israel for his special property. Michael being the son of God that is given authority as the prince of Israel. Daniel 10 and 12. Psalm 135.5, for I myself well know that Jehovah is great. And our Lord is more than all gods. Elohim, tusteus, gods is what they mean. He's over all the gods. Israel is his special property. Jehovah is Lord more than all gods. Everything that Jehovah delighted to do, he's done in heavens and in the earth, in the seas and all the watery deep. He's causing vapors to ascend from the extremity of the earth. He's made even sluices for the rain. He's bringing forth the wind from his storehouses. He who struck down the firstborn ones of Egypt, right? Confronting the gods of Egypt there, both man and beast. He sent signs and miracles in the midst of you, O Egypt, right? Again, referring to his judgment of the nations upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants. He who struck down many nations and killed potent kings, even Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and who gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to Israel, his people. Jehovah, your name is to time indefinite, O Jehovah, your memorial is to generation after generation. For Jehovah will plead the cause of his people. He will feel regret even over his servants. The idols of the nations, the works are silver and gold, the work of the hands of earthly man, a mouth they have, but they can speak nothing, right? Just like we read earlier about the carved images being worthless, valueless, right? But there's still gods behind them. There's still demons behind them. The text said that explicitly. But the idols cannot speak. Ears they have, they can give ear to nothing. Also, there exists no spirit in their mouth. The idols are nothing. The gods behind them are something. Those making them will become just like them. Everyone who is trusting in them. O house of Israel, do you men bless Jehovah? O house of Aaron, do you men bless Jehovah? O house of Levi, do you men bless Jehovah? You fears of Jehovah, bless Jehovah. Blessed out of Zion be Jehovah who is residing in Jerusalem. Praise Jah, you people. Give thanks to Jehovah, you people, for he is good. His loving kindness is to time indefinite. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his loving kindness is to time indefinite. The God, Elohim, or to, to, Toi, to, the, oh, there's an Iota subscript there because it's in the dative case. Of the gods, Ha Elohim, Ton Theon. He's the God of the gods. The sons of God receive their authority over the nations from God. That's why they're answerable to him. That's why, as you're going to see in a moment, when he goes into Psalm 82 and judges them, it's because he's their God. They're answerable to him. They're answerable to him, as we've read, depending on how they treat not just Israel, but the widow, the fatherless boy, the poor, the meek of their own people. Psalm 137, 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. We also wept when we remembered Zion. Excuse me. Upon the poplar trees in the midst of her, we hung our harps. For there, those holding us captive asked us for the word of a song. And those mocking us, rejoicing, sing for us one of the songs of Zion. Or they, while they were in captive in Babylon. How can we sing the song of Jehovah upon foreign ground? If I should forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand be forgetful. 
Let my tongue stick to my palate. If I were not remembering you, if I were not to make Jerusalem ascend above my chief cause for rejoicing, remember, O Jehovah, regarding the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who were saying, lay it bare, lay it bare to the foundation within it. The nations, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be despoiled, happy will he be that rewards you with your own treatment with which you treated us. Speaking of Jerusalem or the Israelites, happy will he be that grabs a hold and does not, and does dash to pieces your children against the crag. Verse one of Psalm 138, I shall laud you with all my heart in front of other gods. I shall make melody to you. Elohim, the Septuagint identifies them as angels again. Just like we saw previously with the angels behind the carved images and demons behind idols of the nations. The sons of God being appointed over the nations, Deuteronomy 32.8, Daniel uh, chapters 10 through 12 specifically, but elsewhere as well, in referring to the princes of Greece and Persia. And then Michael as well. Right here referring to the nations, Edom and Babylon, and the way that they're treating the Israelites, the psalmist says he's going to praise God, Jehovah, in front of other gods, specifically the gods of Edom and Babylon. And those gods are specifically identified as angels in the Greek text. Angelo. There's no reference anywhere in the Psalms to humans as gods. There's no reference to humans anywhere in the Bible as gods. Moses is referred to as God in the sense that he's acting as God to Pharaoh. That's it. But that's not anywhere near this context or under discussion or relation to Psalm 82 or how Jesus uses it in John 10 as we're seeing. It's the gods of the nations. It's the angels. It's the demons. It's the spirits of Belial, just like the Melchizedek scroll, written a hundred years or more before Jesus was born, says in relation to Psalm 82. Verse 2 of Psalm 138, I shall bow down toward your holy temple. I'll laud your name because of your loving kindness and because of your trueness. For you have magnified your saying even above all your name. On the day that I called, you proceeded to answer me. You began to make me bold in my strength, my soul with strength. All the kings of the earth will laud you, O Jehovah, for they have heard the sayings of my mouth. I will laud you with all my heart in front of other gods. I shall make melody to you. I think it's undeniably clear that the gods in the Psalms, the God of whom God is God, the God over whom, the gods over whom God is King and Lord and God, are spirits. They're sons of God. Just like the spirits, sons of God took their station before God, even Satan, right? They're not all good spirits. Just because it calls them angels and elsewhere calls them demons, they're spirits. And if they're appointed over the nations in that way, they're sent by God as angelic spirits to manage that nation, to keep things in check with a bunch of sinful people so that when God comes to inspect how they're treating those people, or how those people in those nations under those gods are treating his people while his people are being managed by his son, the appointed one, Michael, to bring forth the the body of the Messiah, he judges them. He corrects them as we read about in several of these Psalms. And that's why the psalmist even says in front of other gods, in the context of Edom 
and Babylon, he will praise Jah. Now let's read Psalm 82 and the context all the way from Psalm 79.1 through to part of Psalm 83. Psalm 83.18, in fact. And you tell me, okay, after all we just read about the gods of the Psalms, about the gods below whom men were made, the angels, about the gods who are behind the nations, behind the carved images, the demons, the angels, the gods, the spirits who are said to be in the skies and who can't resemble God in the original sense in which he is God. You tell me after all that we just read, including the psalmist saying he'll praise God in front of other gods and how other gods, angels, behind carved images would bow down to God. You tell me, after all that, and then the context of those gods and the nations over whom they're gods being corrected, whether or not in Psalm 82, the gods there being judged by God are humans or spirits like all these other references to gods in the Psalms are. Verse 1, Psalm 89, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in a heap of ruins. We're talking about the nations here, right? Obvious. It's explicit. They've given the dead body of your servants as food to the fowls of the heavens, the flesh of your loyal ones to the wild beasts of the earth. They've poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there's no one doing the burying. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a derision and a jeering to all those round about us. How long, O Jehovah, will you be incensed? Forever? How long will your ardor burn just like fire? Pour out your rage upon the nations that have not known you, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon your own name. You're not talking about Israelite judges here. The nations that don't know you, the kingdoms that have not called upon your name, for they have eaten up Jacob. They've caused his own abiding place to be desolated. Do remember us against the heirs of ancestors. Hurry, let your mercies confront us, for we have become greatly impoverished. Help us, O God of our salvation. We're reading the context of Psalm 82. We're headed right toward it. For the sake of the glory of your name and deliver us and cover over our sins on account of your name. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Among the nations, let there be known before our eyes the avenging of the blood of your servants that has been shed. May the sign of the prisoner come in before you. According to the greatness of your arm, preserve those appointed to death. And repay our neighbors seven times into their bosom their reproach, which they have reproached you, O Jehovah. As for us, your people, and the flock of your pasturage, We shall give thanks to you to time indefinite. From generation to generation, we shall declare your praise. O shepherd of Israel, Psalm 80, verse 1, do give ear. You who are conducting Joseph, just like a flock. You who are sitting upon the cherubs, do beam forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, excuse me, do rouse up your mightiness and do come to our salvation. O God, bring us back and light up your face that we may be saved. Verse 4, Psalm 80. O Jehovah, God of armies, how long must you fume against the prayer of your people? You made them eat the bread of tears and you kept making them drink tears upon tears in measure. You set us for strife to our neighbors and our very enemies keep deriding as they please. Just like we read about previously with the gods of the nation, Edom, Babylon, many other nations that were referenced in those Psalms. 
O God of armies, bring us back and light up your face that we may be saved. You proceeded to make a vine depart from Egypt. That's Israel. You kept driving out the nations that you might plant it. You made a clearing before it that it might take root and fill the land. Just like he did when Exodus, Jah assigned his angel to lead the Israelites through the land and fight against the nations, against the gods of those nations, including the princes of Greece, Persia, and Babylon, all of them. At times, of course, allowing them to take his people captive because of the state in which they had fallen, to punish them and keep them alive while he was bringing forth the body of the Messiah, the seed prophesied in Genesis 3.15. The mountains were covered with shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It gradually sent forth its boughs as far as the sea, talking about the vine that departed from Egypt, where he again battled those gods, the gods of Egypt. Bring that here. So talking about that vine that he brought forth from Egypt, it gradually sent forth its boughs as far as the sea into the river, its twigs. Let me make sure. Uh, looks like I... Uh, Make that a little more. There we go. Why have you broken down its stone walls? And why have all those passing by on the road plucked at it? Those passing by on the road, plucking at the vine, Israel, our neighbors, the enemies all around about, the nations. A boar out of the woods keeps eating it away. And the animal throngs of the open field keep feeding upon it, talking about the vine that was brought forth from Egypt. O God of armies, return. Please look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine and the stock that your right hand has planted. And look upon the son whom you have made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire, cut off, we're reading the context leading up to Psalm 82. Everything being taken into account. From the rebuke of your face they perish. Let your hand prove to be upon the man of your right hand. Upon the son of mankind whom you have made strong for yourself. And we shall not turn back from you. May you preserve us alive that we may call upon your name. O Jehovah God of armies, bring us back. Light up your face that we may be saved. O cry out joyfully, you people, to the God, to God our strength. Shout in triumph to the God of Jacob. Strike up a melody and take a tambourine, the pleasant harp together with the stringed instrument. On the new moon blow the horn, on the full moon for the day of our festival. For it is a regulation for Israel, a judicial decision of the God of Jacob. As a reminder, he laid it upon Joseph when he was going forth over the land of Egypt a language that I did not know I kept hearing. I turned aside his shoulder even from the burden. His own hands got to be free even from the basket. In distress I called you and I proceeded to rescue you. Psalm 81, seven. I began to answer you in the concealed place of thunder. I went examining you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, I will give witness, bear witness against you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. Among you there will prove to be no strange God, and you will not bow down to a foreign God. And so Trinitarians and others would have us think that the Israelite judges are what the gods are in Psalm 82. When it says right here, there should be no strange God, not bow down before any God. They're listening to human Israelite judges as gods. That's not apparent from any of the Psalms we've read, which speaks specifically of the gods of the nations who have been appointed by God as their God. And that people like the Psalmist would praise God in front of. Nowhere are Israelite judges in anywhere indicated in any of this. Even right here, no strange God, not bow down to a foreign God. Those are gods of the nations. I, Jehovah, am your God, the one bringing you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I shall fill it. 
But my people have not listened to my voice, and Israel itself has not showed any willingness toward me. And so I let them go in stubbornness of their heart. They went walking in their own counsels. Oh, that my people were listening to me. Oh, that Israel itself would walk in my very ways. Their enemies I would easily subdue, and against their adversaries I would turn my hand. As for those intensely hating Jehovah, they will come cringing to him, and their time will prove to be to time indefinite. And he will keep feeding him off the fat of the wheat, and out of the rock I shall satisfy you with honey itself. Psalm 82, verse 1. After all that leading up to this, and speaking about Israel as God's son, the one whom he brought as a vine from Egypt, whom God's enemies, the the neighbors, kept biting at like a wild boar, who have these foreign gods of the nations over them. After all that, and after all the other extended context readings that we did, to show that the sons of God are gods of the nations over whom God is God, and that he corrects those nations for how they treat the people of those nations, the poor, the widow, the fatherless boy, the meek. After all that, God stations himself in the assembly of the divine one. It really just says the assembly of God. There's no need to translate it divine one here. Now, in the Septuagint, it says gods. Kind of like what we see in Job with the sons of God taking their station before God, contrasted with the earth from which Satan had come. God is stationing himself in the assembly of the God, or God, or gods in the Septuagint. In the middle of the gods, Elohim, Theus, the plural of Theoi in the accusative case, he judges. God enters in the assembly of God or gods, God in Hebrew, gods in Greek, and in the middle of the gods, gods in Hebrew, gods in Greek, he judges. Does this not seem to fit entirely everything we read about God being the one who corrects the nations, who's the God over the gods of the nations, The gods of the nations, Psalm 97, bow down to him. God enters in among the assembly of God, just like in Job 1, 6, and 2, 1, where they take their station before God as sons of God. God enters in among his assembly or council, and in the middle of gods, Elohim, Theus, he judges. In, an, in a context leading up entirely to how the people of the nations are treating Israel. And how he judges those nations and the gods of those nations who bow down to him. Bow down to him, all you gods or angels. Psalm 97, 6 and 7. And then he says as he's judging them, what? What? How long will you keep on judging with injustice and showing partiality to the wicked? Be judges for the lowly one and the fatherless boy, exactly like we read in the context of the gods of the nations being corrected by God because of how they were mishandling their own peoples and how that treatment was affecting Israel. To the afflicted one and the one of little means do justice. It's exactly like what we were reading earlier. In the context of the nations and the gods of those nations. Go back and read all those texts we read leading up to this text right here. Not just from Psalm 79.1, but the other texts in the surrounding context of Psalm 82 in the wider context of Psalms where the nations were over and over and over again, and the gods of those nations over and over again were addressed by the psalmist or by God and told to bow down to him, were corrected by him. He's doing the exact same thing right here. There's nothing different at all 
except the context and the wording used here. Provide escape for the lowly one and the poor one. Out of the hand of the wicked ones, deliver them. They have not known. They don't understand. In darkness they keep walking about. All the foundations of the earth are made to totter because of these gods and the judgments that they're making. I myself have said, you are gods. All of you sons of the Most High. So God, in the context immediately of Psalm 82 and in the wider context of the book of Psalms as we read, God stations himself in his assembly or the assembly of the gods in the Greek, just like we also see depicted in Job 1, 6, 2, 1. And in the middle of those gods, Elohim, Theus, he judges. He addresses them in the exact same ways that the nations were corrected and the gods of those nations addressed and told to bow down to him, as we read, and then he says, because of their bad judgments and the way they're treating people, the whole foundation of the earth is being made to totter. And then he specifically addresses them and calls them gods. I said you were gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Surely you will die just as men do. Right? And what would be the point of saying that if they were actually men? Men just die. You don't have to say like men, and it does use the word like. In the Greek, it says, hos. You will die as men do because of all these things that you're doing, even though you're sons of the Most High, appointed as gods, and we're told to do things differently from what you're doing. He's in the assembly of God, in the middle of the gods, talking to gods, sons of the Most High. And like any one of the princes, you will fall, right? So they may think they're not going to fall, but they are going to fall. And Michael makes those princes fall who are actually gods. Whether the princes here are those type of princes or princes like men, they're going to fall because of the way they're failing to judge as gods appointed by God. Rise up, O God, and do judge the earth. For you yourself should take possession of all the nations. He's not talking to Israelite judges here. He's talking to gods in the assembly of God or gods in the middle of gods. Just like we see depicted in Job 1.6 and Job 2.1. And he calls them gods, sons of the Most High, and even says they'll die like men. Not because they're men, but because they're failing as gods. Nothing in the context here is in any way limited to Israelite human judges. It's talking about all the foundations of the earth tottering. It's talking about God judging the earth and taking possession of all the nations. And that would have to include what? Whom? The gods of those nations. The ones he's addressing right here. Let there be no silence on your part. Do not keep speechless. Do not stay quiet, O divine one. It just says God there. I don't know why NWT uses divine ones. not necessary. It's God. L. For look, your very enemies are in an uproar. The very ones intensely hating you have raised their head. Against your people, they cunningly carry on their confidential talk. They conspire against your concealed ones. They have said, right? The very nations he's taking possession of by addressing the nation's gods as gods in the assembly of God or gods, those people are carrying on confidential talk, conspiring against his people, saying, Let's efface them from being a nation. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. This couldn't possibly be talking about Israelite judges. Right? <laughs> They'd be talking about themselves, right? Be talking about annihilating themselves as a nation. It's so ridiculous when you actually read the psalm in context to show he's talking about all the nation's gods whom he addresses as gods 
in the council of God or gods, in the middle of the gods. And the gods everywhere else in the book of Psalms, like we read, are spirits. They're demons. They're angels. Not human judges. For look, we read all that. And they want, so these gods were thinking. This is why he's addressing them, okay? This is that boar that's nipping at the vine that was brought out of Egypt, like we read from Psalm 89 forward to this point, trying to remove Israel as a nation. This is all the preceding and following context of God entering among the gods to judge them, to tell them, look, what are you doing? I said you are gods. And you're not doing, you're not judging the father's boy rightly, right? We read earlier in other contexts, similar to this, how they were also failing the gods of the nations. It was the same thing, almost word for word, even said widows. It wasn't talking just about Israel. It's talking about the gods whose nations are failing. The whole foundations of the earth are being made to totter. So he has to take possession of these nations and judge the earth because they're not doing it. They're carrying on confidential talk to try to remove God's people as a nation. That they may be remembered no more because they know it's through them the Messiah is coming. They know they have Michael and they're battling with them. That's why Michael is depicted as battling with these spirit princes. And why Satan is depicted as resisting Michael or coming where he goes like fighting over Moses' body. So there's this constant conflict between the gods of the nations and the world, including Satan, and God and his spirit sons whom he appoints. Look, it goes on to say, for with the heart they have unitedly exchanged counsel. Against you they proceed to conclude even a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia together with the inhabitants of Tyre. Also Assyria itself has become joined with them. They have become an arm of the sons of Lot. Do to them as to Midian, as to Sisera, as to Jabin at the Torrent Valley of Kishron. They were annihilated at Endor. They became manure for the ground. As for their nobles, make these like Oreb, like Zeb, and like Zeba, and like Zaluna, all their dukes, who have said, let us take possession of the abiding place of God for ourselves. This is about the gods of the nations, everyone. I mean, I don't know how more explicit it could be. It could be stated in the context of him in the middle of the gods, in the assembly of God or gods, calling them gods like we saw they were gods in numerous other texts in the Psalms, as demons or angels behind the carved image or idols of the nations that fight against God's people and even abuse their own people, widows, fatherless boys, the poor, the meek, all of them. We read that earlier. We read that just a second ago. It's all consistent with these gods being spirit sons of God, sons of the Most High who are gods. Spirits of Belial, like the Melchizedek correctly interpreted, Melchizedek scroll correctly interpreted it over a hundred years before Jesus was born. We'll get to Jesus' use of this text in just a moment. Oh God, make them like a, a thistle world, like stubble, before a wind, like a fire that burns up the forest, like a flame that scorches the mountains. And just that way, may you pursue them with your tempest and may you disturb them, right? He's correcting the nations like we read numerous times earlier with your own storm wind. Fill their faces with dishonor that people may search for your name, O Jehovah. Oh, they may be ashamed and be disturbed for all times and may become abashed and perish that people may know that you, whose name is Jehovah, you alone, 
are the most high over all the earth. The God of the gods, right? We read that several times. The God and Lord and King of all gods. Of all the gods of Edom, the Ishmaelites, the, of Moab, the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyre, Assyria, Midian, Sisera, Jabin, Kishron, Endor. My friends... I don't know, as I said, how more clearly it could be presented, and yet Trinitarians do not get it. They can't get it. You want to know why they can't get it? You want to know why Trinitarians absolutely fail to understand the sons of God as gods? Because they don't understand how Jesus can be a son of God and those gods be gods, and still believe in the Trinity. It all has to do with the Trinity. It has nothing to do with the texts in the Bible, specifically the Psalms, that call the sons of God, whether they're the angels of God, below whom God made men, a little lower than, or the gods who are angels, who are demons behind the carved image of the nations, it all has to do with their inability to involve those gods and understand Jesus as a son of God and therefore also a God and still accept the Trinity. It's the Trinity that's blocking them. It's their later doctrine. It's their metaphysicality. It's their theological beliefs that force them to reject what we can all see and that even the Melchizedek scroll explicitly told everybody the gods of Psalm 82 are spirits. They're angels. They're demons. They're sons of the Most High. Gods. Elohim. Theoi. And let's get into explicitly why Jesus' use of Psalm 82. Trinitarians blow this too. You read a Trinitarian Bible, like I talked about my NWT Part 2, Superior, Moral, and Translationally. You read a Trinitarian Bible's translation of John 10, 33, and you're going to see they don't understand. They don't understand what we just read and showed clearly that there are gods. There are actual sons of God who are gods, who take their station in among God, among in, among, in front of God, and whom God enters in amongst, in the council of God or gods, to judge the gods, calling them gods. And so, we have a similar situation here. We have here exactly what Trinitarians do to us today. Because instead of reading and accepting the one they say they believe in, they reject him. He's not good enough for them. The son of God who is a God like all the other sons of God is rejected by Trinitarians. And in place of that God, that son of God, they put a person of God who's not a personal God, but who's a one what. That, is, that has three persons that are fully God. But there's only one what? Even though in the Bible there's one God who's one person, the Father, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Trinitarians reject this. And they reject the Son of God and the sons of God as gods and try to argue that Psalm 82, God's entering in among gods and the council of gods and calling human Israelite judges gods. They don't know what to do with Psalm 8, 5. They mistranslate that too and say that man was placed a little lower than God most of the time. Even though in Hebrews 2, 7 and 9, the author there quotes Psalm 8, 5, 6 and accepts the Greek translation of Elohim as angels. Just like we saw several times in the Psalms, the gods are angels over whom God is God, which is why Jesus as a son of God often calls God his God. 
John 20, 17, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, 2, my God. Well, that's someone who has a God over him in both a human and a resurrected state sense. Just like the angels who are gods in the Psalms have God as their God, even though God calls them gods. Because they're not the kind of gods that are like him or who can even resemble him in the ultimate original sense in which Jesus himself said, only the Father is the true God, the original God, the God after whom all others are gods. John 10, 24, Therefore the Jews encircled him and began to say to him, How long are you to keep our souls in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us outspokenly. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and yet you do not believe. It's exactly like today. We get Trinitarians who love to come home, and not all of you. Some of you are, are nice and you just sincerely believe in the Trinity and we understand. It's a long-standing tradition and doctrine that's the product of man. But not all of you are like this. Not all the Jews at this time were like this. But these Jews are like this. And many Trinitarians are like this. They like to come and encircle you and try to entrap you and bother you instead of promoting their own views that most people are rejecting. So they have to come. They have to try to deal with our beliefs that many people are accepting because they're explicit in the text. When God the Father, I told you and you do not believe. We tell Trinitarians. We show Trinitarians. They still do not believe. Doesn't matter. I could do a thousand videos and point out one God the Father. I could do a hundred videos more and point out the gods of Psalm 82 are spirit sons of God like the Melchizedek scroll says as well. Doesn't matter. They only care about the Trinity. Hey, that's what matters. And anything against the Trinity, they reject. It's because it's their tradition that they're using to invalidate the text, just like these Jews did. The works that I am doing in the name of my Father bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are none of my sheep. These are the people who are worshiping the God of the Bible, and they still couldn't see. So it's no wonder today that many people claim to worship the God of the Bible and cannot see. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them everlasting life and they'll by no means ever be destroyed and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What my father has given me is greater than something than all other things and no one can snatch them out of the hand of the father. I and the Father are one. Just like in John 17 when he says, may you be one. May they be one just as we are one. Just as. In the same way. So it's not talking about a metaphysical sense in which the Trinitarians later teach of homoousios, given a term contributed to the Trinitarian belief system by Constantine himself. It's not in the Bible. It contradicts the Bible. The metaphysic in the Bible is character tes hypostaseos. Copy, reproduction, imprint of God's being. Not one in substance, not sharing the same substance, Trinitarians. There's no homoousios in the biblical text. I'm sorry. Please stop confusing people with what's next. So the Jews hear this. They understand this, right? He's calling God whom? His Father. So what does that make him? It makes him a son of God. Once more the Jews lifted up stones to stone him. Jesus replied to them, I displayed you many fine works from the Father. Right? They're not even my works. I'm not doing what I can't, what I want. I'm, I'm doing what the Father tells me. I don't come on my own initiative. I'm not doing my own will. He says this over and over and over again. What I teach is not mine. My works, I'm doing works from the Father. What, do you, what don't you believe? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Father's working through me. Right? He's not like the other gods who are doing their own thing, trying to remove Israel as a nation, right? Trying to, to destroy them from the earth, not looking after the father of this boy and the widow and the poor and the meek. Right? Is that works from the Father? No. 
He went in and judged them because they weren't doing what he wanted them to do with all these sinful humans and while he's trying to bring forth the seed through Israel. So here's Jesus doing the works from his father and he wants to know from which one are they, for which one are they stoning him? Jews answer him, we are stoning you, not for a fine work, but for blasphemy even because you, although being a man, make yourself a god. Theos. Now many Trinitarian Bibles will say God here. But does that make sense in light of what we are going to read next? You tell me. Jesus answered them. Here's my response. Here's my defense. Oh, you're stoning me because you say I'm making myself a god or god. We'll leave it open for right now. You're doing that? Okay. Here's my reply. This is what I have to say in my defense. You understand, Trinitarians? Here's my answer to that. This is what Jesus is telling them is the response, Trinitarians. This is what you, as Trinitarian believers in the Christ, are supposed to do. You're supposed to answer the way he answers, okay? You follow Jesus, right? Okay. Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods, plural, So what's he doing here, Trinitarians? The accusation he made himself God, or Theos, a God, in the singular, he's answering with a plural. Do you understand that? I want to make sure you understand what's happening here. Because it seems like you never understand what's happening here. Accusation of being the singular response, isn't it said others are the plural? Oh, well, that must mean then that the plural is an appropriate answer to the singular in direct contradiction to Robert M. Bowman Jr.'s claim we have to use texts that use the singular, which we can do. Judges 13 calls the angel that ascends off the altar God, Elohim, and Theos. So we can do that too. But the Son of God, the subject of all this controversy, has Jews accusing him of being theos. And what does he do? He uses a plural. He doesn't use a metaphysical sense in which someone can be a person of God. He uses the plural gods from a text that calls the angels sons of god gods if he called gods those against whom the word of god came and yet the scripture cannot be nullified do you say to me whom the father sanctified and dispatched into the world you blaspheme because i said here's what i said this is what i said I am God's son. From that, the Jews took him to mean he was claiming to be a theos. What did we read about all the sons of God in all those texts? From the sons of God texts, Genesis, Job, and Psalm 89, to the actual God's texts in the Psalms surrounding Psalm 82 and in Psalm 82, they're sons of the Most High over whom God is God. The Jews understood the claim to be God's son to be a claim to be a God. And even if they took it wrongly, right, that the way Trinitarian Bibles translate it, in verse 33, God, capital G-O-D, the Son of God uses gods in the plural. So it doesn't matter what the Jews thought he meant. He tells you what he means. He means God or a God in the same sense in which the sons of God are called gods by God. 
And even if we wanted to grant the completely unsupported interpretation from both the context of Psalms, the wider context of Psalms, and the Melchizedek scroll on Psalm 82, even if we grant the Trinitarian idea that God is calling human Israelite judges gods in the council of God, or gods in which he judges them as gods, even if he's calling human Israelite judges gods there, that's the text Jesus used. You understand? He didn't use any other text that might be a way you could understand him as the equal of God in a metaphysical Trinitarian sense. He used the plural in response to the singular to show that there's another sense in which people can be called gods or a god without violating the one God texts. Because we just read a whole bunch of them, did we not? Did we not read text after text after text? that calls the sons of God, gods, that calls the nations, gods, gods, over whom God is God and King and Lord? We did! There were, there were several texts that specifically called those gods, gods, that in the Greek texts are identified as demons and angels, and that in Psalm 8, 5 are called God, angels after being called gods in the Hebrew, not only in the Greek of Psalm 8, 5 and 6, but in the Hebrew text, in the Greek text of Hebrews 2, 7 and 9. They knew that's why when he called himself God's son, they could accuse him of being a theos because the sons of God are gods. It's so obvious. Only a Trinitarian with later doctrine blinding their eyes could fail to understand it. Even the Jews who didn't accept Jesus knew that when he called himself a son of God, he was making himself a god like all those other sons of God, <laughs> just like the Melchizedek scroll correctly interpreted too. They accepted that those gods, those sons of God were gods, that the angels were gods, that the demons are gods. And Jesus' point is that if the gods who are sons of God in Psalm 82 can be called gods, and they're being judged adversely for failing in their duties as gods appointed over the nations to look after the poor, to look after the widow and the fatherless boy and the meek ones of the earth, and to keep them from, from burdening and oppressing and even annihilating his son Israel from the earth, just like we read in all those Psalms. If those gods... If those sons of God, those angels, those demons can be called gods, in the plural, how is it that the Jews of his day and Trinitarians today can claim that it's blasphemy, which they do, to call the Son of God a God? When God who is the God of all gods, like we read several times in the Psalms? How is it the Trinitarians and the Jews of Jesus' day, or even today, can say we blaspheme when we call Jesus a son of God, a God, when God called those against whom he came gods, and the son of God, who is a God, is the one, the Father, the one God, sanctified and sent forth into the world, not to be some separate God that opposes God and speaks of his own originality, but who is God's son, who does everything the Father tells him, the one through whom the Father works, so that you can hardly tell the difference between them. How can you Trinitarians and Jews of today or in Jesus' day, call that blasphemy. After everything we read in the context immediate and surrounding of Psalm 82 and the Melchizedek scroll, providing a pre-Christian interpretation, supporting our view, how can you continue to say we're blaspheming by calling Jesus a God in the same way that all the sons of God are gods over whom God is God? 
when the very argument Jesus gives in John 10, 33 through 36, is the same position that we're telling you is what we mean when we call Jesus or any of the other sons of God a God.